out a, a little bit about that. I'm going to be sending out the full guidelines this week. No. Um, but just as a quick reminder, um, this is the chance for um, members to put together a little series that you'll be sharing if you want. Uh, participation encouraged. You don't have to, but it's great when you do. Um, and a little series of about up to eight images. It can be about anything you want, a theme. It doesn't have to have a theme. Um, and it's just a chance to kind of share the work that you're doing and um, with the rest of us. So uh, last year we had quite a lot of participation. I think we had between 20 and 25 people sharing work. Um, so we won't have a guest speaker because it's all about our membership. And we also will not have critique that night but you will still be able to submit images online for, for voting purposes, but we won't be doing the critique at the meeting. So again, keep your eyes on your email. The guidelines are coming your way, I promise. And thanks for your patience on that. Um, we also have some announcements from uh, Rachel. Oh, or Barbara. <laughs> okay, uh, Barbara, come on up. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the August 2023 meeting. Um, we have three guests tonight. Guests, do this. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Good deal. Okay, so we're at um, 149 numbers right now. Um, we have two re returning, which is Jim and Georgian. Heck, they were here before, but they are returning. A uh, new, um, Paul King, are you here? No. Okay, how about uh, Karina Trimble? Well, I'm not seeing my show. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, welcome. Uh, we're getting on in the season and little bugs are going around and so forth. If you should want hand cleanser or a mask or whatever, we want them back there. They're here every, every month, so know that they're there. If you didn't check in, check in, please. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. Hey, good evening, everybody. I've got several announcements, um, and I'll start with uh, Photography Month 2024, so believe it or not, it's already time to start planning for that. And next April will be the club's third uh, year to participate in Photography Month. And we're going to have two events this year, which will be the Granucci Gallery Exhibition and Photo Walks. And so we're still going to do Gold Country On Camera Challenge under Kathy and crew, but that's going to be at a different time during the year. So Photography Month will be Granucci and Photo Walks. And so coming up soon, believe it or not, it will be time to submit your um, what you would like to submit and be considered for the Renucci Gallery. So Prospectus will come to you uh, via email. Ellen's already got it well in hand. And the deadline for submission is November 25th, which is the Saturday after Thanksgiving. So just keep that in your mind. You have now till the Saturday after Thanksgiving to submit up to three images, which will then be judged by the committee and hopefully one of yours will be selected for uh, the Granucci Gallery exhibition next March. And so you'll know by December 8th if you have an image that's been selected, and then uh, the ex exhibition opens March 8th, and it'll run through April 20th of next year. So just a heads up. And the uh, oh, most important thing, the theme this year is a celebration of water. So be thinking about your finest images that have something to do with water. And I bet almost everybody in the club has something like that. So yes, I see that's right. So looking forward to seeing what you all submit. A uh, second announcement is the club every year has an annual workshop in November. And we're gonna do that again this year. Uh, my co-facilitator is myself and Mike Oitzman. And it's gonna be Saturday, November 4th from nine to 2.30. And this year it's gonna be in-person only. Last year we did have a Zoom option, but this year we're doing in-person only uh, from nine to 2.30 in this very room. And so we're now putting together the schedule and the workshops and there'll be more details coming. But again, mark your calendars. Anything else you wanna add, Mike, on that? Okay, all right. 
Um, so the next two announcements are on behalf of others, uh, on behalf of Ann Wessling, who's our publicity chair. She's not able to be here tonight. So she said, please tell everybody, if you have your own exhibition, from now forward, she, that's her background is PR, and she is graciously offering to help you with the marketing for your own personal exhibition. So do not, yes, two thumbs up to Anne for sure. So don't hesitate. She's she's offering to you to help if there's no challenge, and she's an expert, so why not? So um, her contact information is on the club's uh, website, or catch me during the, the uh, intermission, and I'd be happy to give you her information if you've got a show coming up. So. And then the last one is on behalf of Sheila, who brought a large softbox that's up for grabs in the back of the room. And here's, here's the trick, though, Sheila says. You have to get it back into its little holder. If you can fold it up and get it back into its holder, it's yours for free tonight. So check it out. It's available. It's back there by Frank um, at the intermission. Yes, Chris. Uh, question on the Granucci film. Yep. I think the last two years it's been black and white. Is that true with next year or, or is it? Like, this year's not black and white. We had the monochrome that was just last year. So this year, no, it's color, color or black and white, whatever you choose to submit. Okay. And it was 36, same as last year, size wise, maximum size with frame and matting, 36 by 36. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. That's all for me. Back to you. Uh, I'm just going to give an extra plug. If you haven't participated in the Granucci, it really is such a good opportunity to share your work and, and show it in a really nice venue. Um, so if you have done it, do it again. And if you haven't, um, I would really encourage you to give it a try. It's really, it's really a great opportunity. Um, and now we also have some announcements from Mike Wetzner. All right, um, I think most of you know me. If you, you don't, I'm Mike Waitsman. I'm the uh, field trip uh, coordinator for this year. And so I've got two uh, field trips that we've got planned for the next two months. I want to tell you about briefly. Um, the first one is coming up next month on September 16th. And yeah, I know Kathy's going to have a groupie over at Bodhi that, that month, but it also happens to be the dark weekend of the month. And so we're going to do a um, astro photography uh, weekend, and we're going to go up to the to the Donner train tunnels up to the top of Donner Pass, and uh, we're going to do a bit of light painting and some steel wool burning, some examples up here, and spend a, a couple hours there. I've got uh, Dave McCullen's going to join me and bring his light painting tools as well, and we'll set up and have some things for you guys to take pictures of. So if you've never done that type of imagery before. Um, we'll take you through all the details on how to take those types of long exposures. And then, and then in that same evening, um, we'll start at the tunnels. And by the way, uh, it's not officially a part of the um, workshop, but yeah, well, I'll be there early. We're going to go and explore the tunnels before dark. So that part's sort of an extra part of it. But then once it gets dark in the evening, uh, we'll do the, the light painting and, uh, and still we'll burning up there. Uh, assuming that we don't uh, uh, take a look at the conditions, make sure we don't start a fire, of course. Uh, but the tunnels are fully contained. It's, it's impossible to, to start a fire inside the, the concrete, as you see in that one example. But then we'll go uh, a couple miles away uh, over to Sugar Bowl and the gondola parking lot at this time of the year is a perfect view of the Milky Way. As you see in this image I took a couple of years ago uh, to, to image the Milky Way over the, the, the ski resort. Uh, with the lights, and so it's just, it's a, if you've never done Astro, that's a great place. I will be teaching you how to do it if you've never done it before, and even if you're not interested in going all the way up to the tunnels, you could meet us at Sugar Bowl uh, a little later part of the evening and, and just do that part as well if you want to try your hand some Astro. I've been trying to think of a good way to do some Astro introduction where we get some dark sky and it's, you know, in an hour drive of here, and this is a great location this time of year for us to do that, so so again, there's three, two options where you can do the whole day and uh, we'll be up there having fun in the evening on September 16th. And so the registration is open now. I sent you all an email. And if you're new and you didn't get that email, you can come see me uh, during the break if, or if you have more questions. And the second um, work, uh, um, field trip we're gonna do is we're gonna go over in October to uh, the Eastern Sierras for our fall colors trip. This is the first weekend in October. Uh, this is a multi-day trip, so from Friday, it's, it's um, 
a Native American weekend slash Columbus Day weekend. So some of us that are still working and have a holiday, that's why I'm planning for that. So I'll put four days in there. You could come and stay for as long as you can make it work for your schedule, but I'll be there for four days and three nights. We're gonna camp uh, at June Lake and there are still plenty of campsites available. So I try to pick a place where there are plenty of campsites. Camping, you can get a hotel in June Lake. They got great hotels in Airbnb there uh, if you want to do that. And so we got lots of things to go see. June Lake is beautiful right, right there, the June Lake Loop. Uh, we'll spend a day there. Uh, we, if we, depending on the colors, we'll go down south to McGee Canyon. It's about an hour south of June Lake. And uh, and then we'll also have the opportunity to do some astro photography at, at Mono Lake in the evening. So it'll still be a great, it's a great time to do some astro photography. A workshop with the Tufas as the foreground, uh, and maybe an early morning sunrise session down at the Tufas as well. And then we'll hit Lundy Canyon on the way back out. And if you guys want to, you could also go to Bodie um, that, as part of that trip as well. So lots of things to do from, from that uh, center point. So those are the two workshops we're going to set up for in the next two months. And I hope to uh, see some of your bright faces out there taking pictures. Thanks. <laughs> What? What's the date on the June Lake one? The June Lake one is that it starts on Friday, the October 6th. It's the first weekend. Okay. Yeah. From six to month, from Friday to Monday. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Some more awesome opportunities there. Um, so yeah, if anyone has questions about those, please talk to Mike, our field trip coordinator. Does anyone have any announcements that oh they did? Yes. That I missed. Uh, David and then Rick, you have some too. Okay. I'll just do it from here. I don't need you don't need to invite. Um October 16th at the library. Um, we're gonna have a showing of all our Tanzania photos. So anybody that would like to come, uh, seven to nine. And there's a little sheet in the back there. Uh, you have to sign up for it. it's free, but I want people to sign up so that we don't run out of seat so you'll see a link in the, on that sheet if you would just all you have to do is register and that's october. it october 16th it's a monday night seven to nine seven to nine thirty something like that and there's you know i have a bunch of photos bill had a bunch of photos john siebert had a bunch of photos desert david nelson laurie uh did i, did I, did I leave anybody else out here I, I think that was it from the club. Probably but. only 10,000 photos. <laughs> yeah, yeah, only, only 10,000. Maybe you won't be bored. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rick, and then thanks, David. Uh, Rick, did you have something? Yeah, real quick. Um, this afternoon, I take the bush over on Saturday between apples. I have that here. They're nice. absolutely free, and I have little sacks. All right. Good snacks. Mm, good snacks. Thank you. <laughs> All right, last call for announcement. Anyone else before we move on to the main uh, speaking event of the evening? And I'm very excited to introduce our speaker tonight. Some of you may already know him if you've had any involvement with the a very popular Wild and Scenic Film Festival that comes up at the beginning of the year. You may already know Eric Gunn, who is the operations director at the festival. Um, he's also a photographer in his own right, and um, he is going to be here speaking to us tonight. So uh, just a little bit about him, some highlights from the bio. Uh, growing up in the Midwest, Eric's love of nature and waterways was established early at summer camp with a focus on extended wilderness tripping in the North Woods. After crafting his own unique degree at Ohio State University, uh, Eric began his professional career with over a decade of experience managing and booking musicians at high profile events around the globe. And following years of life in the Midwest, he relocated to Nevada City region in 2012 and today continues to be an avid outdoorsman, an enthusiastic photographer, especially with long exposure in astrophotography. He enjoys sharing his vision and the natural beauty of our earth to help connect others in appreciation and gratitude for the natural world, which I'm sure we'll hear more about in regards to wild and scenic as well. So please join me in introducing and uh, in welcoming Eric Dunn. Thank you. Oh, fine. Thanks, Grace. Hello, everyone. 
Thanks for coming out this evening. Excited to share some photos and tell you a little bit about Wild and Scenic and what we're up to. Um, so I suppose, as Grace mentioned, part of why I'm here today is um, I've enjoyed photography since I was in the single digits. Uh, often, you know, working with a disposable waterproof camera camp that I would, you know, take my photos and then not get to develop till the end of the, the camp season. Um, and, it, you know, really started my journey capturing um, my experiences traveling throughout the Northwoods. I was lucky enough to grow up uh, getting to do extended wilderness trips around the Northwoods and you know, pictures of my friends were intermixed with, uh, you know, a moose followed by a, a sunset. And then, uh, you know, there were those shots that I could never catch on a disposable camera, like the northern lights dancing above us when we awoke in the middle of the night on Isle Royale National Park. Um, and so, you know, over time, I've gotten to chase some of those images and work on capturing some of those images that uh, the disposable uh, 35 millimeter was not able to, to catch. Um, I've also had a great respect for the power of photography and visual storytelling to elicit feelings and memories. Uh, growing up, my father was an avid photographer, um, capturing my childhood in, in great detail. Um, and you can see a little of that captured up there on the screen. Um, so now I can let him know that I've displayed his photography in this group uh, since he had to, you know, put his photography on hold to, to deal with raising myself and my brother. Um, but I, I really had a great respect for the power of photography. Um, after losing my mother at a young age, that documentation really took on a whole new light of being able to, you know, still have glimpses of, of things lost. And then as the grandson of a Holocaust survivor, um, I'm grateful to have had uh, her take part in Spielberg project to record her story, uh, which is a story that, you know, she rarely shared with even her close family members. And so um, all of that kind of roots my appreciation for the visual storytelling form. Um, all that said, you know, when I was told that I was supposed to present some of my own photography tonight and not just come and tell you about Wild and Scenic Film Festival, <laughs> I'll admit that I, I had a bit of uh, imposter syndrome creep up uh, for me. And I, I picked Grace up and was like, wait, wait, wait. I thought I was just telling them about Wild and Scenic stuff. Um, and it's kind of ironic because I've, I've spent a lot of my life uh, really working and coaching people on that same issue of imposter syndrome uh, and telling them how to overcome that. Um, but, you know, just like all the artists that I've worked with over the years, um, you know, I'm not great at selling my own artwork as much as I am of lifting others up. Um, and so, as mentioned, after graduating uh, college with a degree that I created called Communicating in the Music Industry, uh, I spent about a decade doing just that, uh, working in the music industry as a tour manager, uh, booking agent, and a band manager. And that opportunity afforded me uh, many opportunities to travel around the world, in the US and Europe especially, uh, capturing my adventures along the way. Um, and this was, you know, during the burgeoning times of social media and technology. And so we were uploading our photos to MySpace and we were, you know, shooting um, with early Blackberry camera phones along the road and, and things like that. Um, but, you know, despite that, I really enjoyed capturing life on the road, living um, a lifestyle that was a little at odds with the general flow of the rest of the world. I uh, saw a lot of sunrises and entered a lot of cities past sunset um, and left, you know, at lunchtime. Um, and that was my kind of experience of the world. Um, and so, yeah, I really enjoyed, you know, Stretches of long highway mixed with crowds of you know people at shows, band members, and 
probably just like a, a touch of fully dressed soil <laughs> as well. Um, so these are just some photos from those times. As you can tell, some of the quality on these is not up to par. So again, I was shooting uh, with like cool pics, uh, an icon, you know, camera to to megapixel or something like that, uh, mixed with the BlackBerry and whatever else we, we had. Uh, there's a little of that belligerence I mentioned. Uh, <laughs> and then the results on the right. Um, this is a High Sierra Music Festival, for those of you who've attended. And uh, yeah, so like I mentioned, I was, uh, you know, at the time shooting pretty rudimentary stuff with Blackberries and cool picks. Um, and given the fidelity of the internet at that point, it also wasn't too big of a deal. Uh, although it, you know, pains me a little bit now that like the only shot of us playing in front of 7,500 people at Lincoln Center is like 250 pixels wide or something. <laughs> uh, but despite that, you know, the goal for me is largely utilitarian. Um, you know, we worked with pro photographers for official band photos. Often the venues were providing photographers that would shoot uh, band members, you know, during the show. And so my main goal was often capturing the band with large crowds um, at important venues, important festivals, um, and using that for my own work as manager to leverage that into um, bigger and better gigs. And so, you know, even if it wasn't the clearest image, as long as I was telling that story of what the band was doing and that, you know, this weird freaky band out of Tulsa, Oklahoma that was, you know, playing Newport Jazz Festival, um, that was kind of the arc of the story that I was telling at that time. Um, be it, you know, some of the highs of Newport Jazz Festival and fancy hotels or, uh, you know, really seedy motels on the edge of Camden, New Jersey, something <laughs> like that. Yeah. It's a wide range of what we experienced. Um, so you can see, you know, I really focused on a mix of life, you know, on the right there, there's a, a band member that was working on composing uh, some work at the time while we were on tour. Um, this one, this one's pretty special. Uh, that train in the background was our train, and I managed to capture us missing our train um, <laughs> because we, we didn't realize that that was our train. And so I've got this, this great photo to remind me of this memory that we stood there until the train pulled out and we're kind of waiting around for the next train to pull in. And then it all came together that we had just missed our train. Um, so, you know, a lot of these photos um, that I worked on this time were to tell those stories from the road using my space and those early tools. Um, a lot of train travel in Europe, which was really enjoyable. And uh, again, a lot of crowd shots that I was working to just, you know, capture that, yeah, these weirdos from Tulsa are, you know, playing the, the sold out crowd at this European Jazz Festival. Um, and then a little more of that debauchery in the, the bottom right there with uh, the band signing an album saying, we love you, thank you for not calling the police. Um, it's the message on that. Uh, uh, Lincoln Center in front of 7,500 people, like I said, you know, it looks okay actually on this screen, I'm impressed, but overall uh, a little lacking. Um, and yeah, you know, a mix of showing the band in action on the road, um, as well as some of those shots of, of the band playing. The name of the band is called Jacob Fred Jazz Odyssey or JFJO because Jacob Fred Jazz Odyssey is kind of a mouthful. Right? <laughs> yeah, it was a bit of the bane of my existence for plenty of the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is just a few more shots here. Um, So yeah, you can see, you know, I tried to mix in some, some humor, like our, our own big bear posing in front of his effigy and uh, the band getting group foot massages in Amsterdam. So, you know, I just never knew what you'd find on our MySpace page. 
Um, and so, yeah, you know, a lot of this, again, it was not, the goal wasn't perfection. It was, you know, we were moving fast on very little sleep, um, traveling across time zones. And so the goal was capturing it, but, you know, perfection was not that goal. And so I think that, you know, some of that uh, acceptance of imperfection has, you know, carried over into my current photography um, in that a photo can still convey a strong story and a strong message, even if there's some noise or some blur to it. Um, okay, who am I kidding? I, I strive for perfection. I hate the scene, the noise in the photo that I wish I could clean up. Um, but I'm, I'm at peace with those shots uh, that come out less than perfect because they still have value to me, be it communicating a story to someone else or, you know, reminding me of a moment in time. Um, you know, admittedly, I might see it and cringe a little knowing that maybe I could do better. Um, but nonetheless, you know, it brings me back to that moment. And, and that's my own selfish goal in my photography is, is capturing those and having, you know, those for, for future posterity's sake. And, um, you know, one image that comes to mind is this night exposure of Travertine Hot Springs in the Eastern Sierra. Um, and, you know, there were numerous elements that I had to overcome shooting this shot. Um, I was naked in a slippery mud bottomed hot spring in the middle of the night. And I had my, my tripod submerged into the hot springs. The, the camera was sitting just above the water level. Um, and, you know, when I would trigger a shot, I had to try and stay very still. Um, but I didn't want to get out because it was cold outside. And so I wanted to stay in the hot water while I, I took this series of shots. And, you know, in the end, I captured this huge meteorite streaked across the sky uh, that my wife and I both had to try really hard not to yell out and shout because we were trying to be still for the photo. Um, but it was such a streaker across the sky that, you know, was, you, you couldn't miss it. And so, you know, I was really happy to have captured that image, even though, you know, I do wish that, well, you can't even see it in this image, but there's some noise at the bottom and, you know, some things that I'd like to improve. Um, this is another shot from that same uh, series that uh, um, So as mentioned, in 2011, I moved across the country to pursue a new career entrepreneurial venture with my wife. Uh, we lived in Smartsville for about seven years um, and enjoyed life on seven acres. Uh, working with the land and traveling around the state to trade shows and farmers markets. And this lifestyle allowed for a fair bit of flexibility for me um, and enabled a, a great many adventures around the state um, and across the country. And that flexibility, I think, has been a secret to my photography because, you know, I, I had the ability to wake up in the middle of the night and go shoot for three hours from, you know, 1 a.m. To, to 5 a.m. or something so that I could capture the Milky Way the way I wanted to. Um, I could, you know, time my day so that I had time off for golden hour to capture golden hour. Um, and so that flexibility I'm, I've been really grateful for. Uh, so this is a shot from Monument Valley on my way across the country out to California. This is another from that same uh, Monument Valley. And a year later, I finally got a camera that could help me capture these amazing places that I found myself so frequently. And so, you know, as a nonprofit worker, it's no surprise that I'm still shooting with that same Sony A7 II. Um, it has treated me very well over the years and it's been through some things. There's some scratches and, you know, it, it, you can tell that it's lived a uh, full life. Um, but it continues to be a workhorse for me and allow me to really explore concepts and ideas that um, I, I had in my mind that I wasn't able to execute on with the equipment that I was using previously. Um, and, you know, throughout the time, I think one common thread has definitely been a deep affinity for long exposure, um, exploring time and light with long exposure, be it astrophotography, light painting, uh, using ND filters at the river or water, 
Um, those are all things that I really love. Um, so this is a shot from the Eastern Sierra, uh, Long Valley, looking west towards the Sierra Range. Um, and Eastern Sierra is definitely one of my, my favorite haunts. This is another one from uh, uh, White Mountain Peak. That's uh, the third highest peak in California behind Whitney and uh, Williamson, I think. So um, if you haven't been over there to the uh, Crystal Cone Pines in that region, definitely recommend it. Um, this is an example of some astrophotography. This is from Upper Sardine Lake by the Sierra Buttes. Uh, what I love about this photo is the capture of the moon rising uh, over the mountains. And so you've got that Milky Way presence within the light from the moon coming over the hill. Um, again, you know, I really enjoy exploring uh, long exposure um, shots in various forms. And so a number of these shots that I'm gonna be moving through kind of quickly here um, are various long exposures around the state. This is uh, from Mendocino Coast. Um, and this was one of those where, you know, I, I got out there at midnight and spent a couple hours traipsing around and trying to figure out what my, what my shot was that night. Um, this is from Laughlin National Park and uh, so is this, and I'm a big fan of incorporating costumes and props into work whenever possible. Um, I'm grateful to have a, a willing partner and my wife to put on whatever, you know, weird outfit we decide on. Um, so she got the sequence jacket that night. And definitely recommend using your partner in the same way. Dress them up. Um, you know, it can be a bit trite, but I, I uh, you know, can't help but grab the forest silhouette against the Milky Way whenever I can still manage to be awake for it. So I have no shortage of these shots. It's, you know, it's easy and a go-to, but um, they always, you know, leave me feeling, feeling happy. Um, this is hiking along the PCT towards the immigrant wilderness. Uh, soon after this, the clouds gathered and we had to race to our campsite and it started hailing on us, but this is where we ended up in the end. And you can see our tent tucked into the trees over to the left there um, after the, the hail had fallen. And here we are, that, that same tent location uh, that night under the Milky Way. Um, <clears throat> I really like how photos like this spark the imagination. Um, you know, like, wait, are those petroglyphs? What do they mean? Where are they located? Who created them? How can I go visit them myself? Um, you know, I, I think that there's a, a power in in these kinds of images that you know just make you think and, and wonder a bit. That's called uh, thirteen moons. Um, so often in my work, I've, you know, returned to places and really <laughs> to craft images of that place over time. So, you know, I'll visit there once or twice, get a feel for the place, and then over time start, you know, creating images that I kind of have in my mind's eye um, after a few visits there. So I had a, a real lucky streak for a while and kept getting these reservations at this beautiful state park along the coast. I'm gonna leave it to you to investigate or reach out to me and maybe I'll, I'll tell you the secret. They're pretty hard to get, but I had, a, I had a lucky streak and I got to spend a lot of nights at this place. And there are these uh, cabins on the coast. There's no electricity, no running water, but they're basically perched on the side of a, a cliff, basically right at the Pacific. And uh, they're a really lovely time. And so, um, I love this long exposure of the Pacific with those in the background. And I love how the, the cabins are catching the light, last light in that one on the windows. Um, and, you know, I always try and find a mix of capturing the scenery around me and the people I'm with. Um, again, as far as just telling a story and, 
you know, be it if I'm telling that story to my grandmother, who I'm sending photos to and, and sharing what my brother and I are up to, um, or if I'm, you know, sharing that far and wide. Um, so these are just some photos of that location. Um, yeah, you know, a mix of action shots, hot, hot marshmallows stretched out of the fire, um, and then, you know, the beach scene. Uh, and one of the most unique parts of this area is there's a uh, coastal hot spring. Uh, again, you'll have to research it, look into it, if you can find it. It's only accessible during low tide. Um, and so during low tide, there's uh, this cave and the cave is filled with hot springs water. And uh, you're able to get in this cave and uh, you know, the Pacific is kind of what we're staring out at in that photo. Um, and yeah, it's a pretty unique place. Um, this is one last shot of that location. And so, yeah, I really enjoyed tracing around the state, um, having beach fires with friends. And as I mentioned, you know, because of my flexibility, I've really been able to. Um, focus on capturing light during times of day that uh, many other people might normally be working or something like that. Um, and, you know, after decades in Ohio and then Oklahoma, uh, the mountains of the West, you know, they can't help but uh, capture my imagination and put me in awe. Um, so I've, I've got no shortage of mountain photos along the way. Um, I love the interplay of clouds with, with mountains, and whenever I'm able to capture that, um, it gives me great joy. It's Mount Shasta hiding behind there. Um, on this one, this is a hiker descending from Angel's Point um, in Zion National Park. And I, I always loved how I was able to catch him on this ridge line and the way that the, the ridge line kind of disappears into blackness. Um, and yeah, again, you know, storytelling wise, uh, you know, this brings me back. This is my father helping my stepmother through the cinder at uh, Lassa National Park. Uh, she doesn't get around too well. She's a tiny thing, and like 90 pounds or something. Um, so, you know, those kinds of memories and storytelling to me is just as important as, you know, telling the story of, you know, the plight of, of the group or something like that. Um, there are a couple more from Lassen, Painted Dunes. Um, and sometimes you just have to ride a mountain. Like a, like a cowgirl. <laughs> <laughs> um, included a few photos of white sands, um, which was definitely one of the most surreal landscapes that I've gotten to photograph. And if you ever have a chance to go visit, I highly recommend it. Um, the, the lighting and those white silica dunes are just so unique. Um, it's hard to explain without getting out there, but uh, a few of these shots, you know, I try and portray what, what I got to experience. Uh, so a number of these next shots are gonna, I'm gonna go real quick, but they're uh, photos, you know, that are longer exposures. Uh, these are from Costa Rica. Um, again, it's always nice to have a willing model by your side. So, you know, take advantage of that to have some perspective. Um, and big thanks to my wife for always posing for me. She's really good at sitting still. So if you're trying to take astrophotography, <laughs> you got to try and find someone that's really good at standing still and do all of that as well. Um, so this is some, some light painting in a uh, lava tube up near Lassen. Um, and this is some light painting from over at Grouse Ridge. Um, and really over time, I've experimented a lot with different types of lights, different movements of light. Um, and a lot of my experience is trial and error, honestly, and just toying with it, seeing what works, and then trying something new next time. Um, 
I also really enjoy subtle movements with uh, within an exposure. So isolating just one variable like the arms in this photo. Um, and then of course, like I mentioned, you know, movement of water. So this is from up uh, in Banff Jasper National Parks uh, in Canada. Um, and then a few of these are from uh, along the Pacific or the Yuba River. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. Again, she's really good at staying still there. I mean, her head is a little blurred, but, but you can like see her, her wedding band pretty clearly. <laughs> A lot of these Yuba photos have gotten used through Wild and Scenic and through Circle. Um, so you never know what's going to happen when you capture some photos by the river. Um, but again, a lot of a lot of uh, trial and error in the process of, of night shooting for me, um, and even with long exposures. So. I just encourage people to get out there and try it. Craig, you were saying that you hadn't tried it before. I'm sure you can pull it off. So. Um, so in my photography, I've, like I said, at times enjoyed uh, focusing in on a subject matter that is uh, part of a recurring series um, and you know had that theme over multiple visits to a location. And so one of those uh, that I wanted to present today is uh, a series that I've titled <laughs> Geothermal Nebulas. Um, and these are overhead shots of hot spring creek beds um, that highlight rainbows and bacterial mats that kind of morph and change throughout seasons. So they shrink or disappear during the wet season, and then they grow and come back and flourish during the, the warmer seasons. Um, and I just have always found they remind me of like telescope shots that you see of deep space. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I call them geothermal nebulas. Um, and they're, they're caused by uh, cyanobacteria. Um, it's a type of bacteria that get their energy from photosynthesis. Um, and so they can grow in these unique locations that um, are not normally hospitable, like hot springs. Um, and so they're the, the main culprit for this phenomenon. Um, and so, you know, over time I've visited one creek bed in particular, and then I've also expanded that to include other, um, locations as I've been able to find them. Um, but I've really enjoyed just seeing the evolution of colors and shapes over time um, in these creek beds and just the, the, the wonder of nature and, and the brilliant colors that it can produce. Um, good, I'm glad you did that, I'm glad that. And if you don't think it looks like outer space, that's fine too. You're know, just, just like, that's a creek bed. That's all I see. That's, that's fine. I, you know, it's okay. Um, so yeah, I, I really enjoyed this series. Um, they look really great up here all big. And I've got a couple that are printed up maybe half this size, but it's inspiring. And it makes me want to really double down and print some of these really large. Um, so another series like this, um, is my, uh, a night shot series of this outhouse, uh, that hopefully at least some of you are familiar with, whether or not you've used it or not, um, you know, hopefully you've gotten to experience this location in Tahoe National Forest. It's a beautiful place. Um, and definitely one of the most scenic locations to use an outhouse that I could imagine. <laughs> It's, you know, perched right on this cliff, and you kind of wonder if it might just tumble off and there's been a spider in there, but luckily that hasn't ever happened yet. Um, and, you know, once again, a lot of this imagery has been trial and error, and so, you know, I went up there for the first time, had this idea of, you know, lighting this outhouse from within, capturing the Milky Way, and had a couple trips where, you know, I just was not happy with how those images were coming out and it was not, you know, fulfilling what I was seeing in my mind's eye. 
Um, but over time, you know, I, I've tried to refine those images, play with lighting, play with, you know, the best way to shoot it. Um, and, you know, I really love how some of these ended up coming out. Um, I, I think that they fulfilled the vision that I, I had in my mind and made it more than worthwhile to stand up on this ridge in the cold and push through uh, the wind and the tiredness to, to capture some of these. Um, we even caught a meteor right there in that one. Just people through the sky. Um, and then one other, and I call this my bathroom art. Okay, looking for some artwork. I have one of them hanging in my restroom at home. Um, so yeah, I never thought I'd be making bathroom art. But it's like this. Uh, one other example um, would be this uh, series of this geyser um, that's over in Lake County. Um, this is a geyser that erupts about every 45 minutes um, and lasts about 10 minutes. Um, so there's only so many shots that you can get, you know, during an hour period of this thing going off. So you really have to, again, you know, I, I went there so many times before I was brave enough to get out there in the middle of the night um, and start exploring and trying to figure out how to, to shoot this thing that, you know, I was witnessing, I was watching the Milky Way rise and I was seeing this thing, you know, shoot up water. Um, and I was like, I, I want to capture that somehow. Um, but it took a lot of trips to figure out the best way to capture it. And I, I still have some, you know, elements that I'd like to refine over time. But some of these images are definitely capturing, you know, what I was seeing. Um, and, you know, this is a really unique geyser. So there's only like 1,100 geysers on Earth. And half of them are located in Yellowstone. Um, and then the majority of them are steam driven. Um, however, this one is a geyser that is primarily driven from the buildup of carbon dioxide um, from the ancient sea floor where, where this water is coming from. And the water gets heated up by a pocket of magma and then builds up um, the, the carbon dioxide. And that pressure is what shoots this water to the surface every 45 minutes. Um, so it's a pretty unique geological phenomenon there. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed getting to, to be with it. Does anyone know where that is? Yeah. You can come talk. You can come <laughs> out too. I'm not going to announce any of them out loud, but you know, if you work for it. We have a link. It'll be sure. It's, yeah. You're going to get Google. <laughs> no. See, so, yeah, I left it for it. All right, and then lastly, as far as my photography goes, um, I wanted to share this series that I did of uh, astrophotography in a cannabis field, locally. Um, so at this time, I had access to this cannabis field, and I had taken note of the dark skies in the area, and I, you know, thought there could be some unique ideas captured, um, and the shoot definitely presented some unique challenges to it, um, you know, not the least of which was navigating in between these huge sticky plants, um, trying to keep myself and my equipment clean. Um, it's dark out, I'm using a red light, you know, a headlamp to find my way around. Um, and, you know, another challenge was keeping lighting to a minimum. So during this stage of cannabis plant growth, they need darkness to, to grow properly. And so while I was given permission to use some lighting, I couldn't just set up lights and leave them on for this time period. So the shoot involved a lot of me quickly setting up lighting, turning it on, running the camera, shooting, turning the lights off, checking the viewfinder to see how it came out, um, and then, you know, adjusting accordingly. Um, sometimes I got to have an assistant. Um, so again, always a big fan of that. And 
other times I, I was just alone out there and would, you know, sometimes put myself on a ladder for scale. Um, and then even more dangerously hop down with leave under the camera. Um, <laughs> really love this shot and the, the ladder just hiding in between the silhouettes of these, these big plants. Um, I love the, the scale that's given by having some people in the shots. Um, this series here, these next three shots, is just a great um, you know, scene of a variety of focal points and, and lighting. Um, so same shot, three different times, with some different focus and different lighting. Um, yeah, played with a variety of different ways of lighting these. Uh, sometimes I put a light hanging deep inside from the center of one. Sometimes I put lights down to the side. Um, I really enjoy the ones with the internal lighting and the, the like strong contrast and light and shadow that comes from that. Um, and then I had some fun light painting as well. Uh, so the Emerald Triangle. Um, I, I, I had to choose, uh, I had to choose words that were short, um, because I was keeping it, I wasn't going into bold exposure, I was keeping it to 30 seconds, and so I had to figure out what words I could try and write, um, in 30 seconds, and, you know, turn that off. Weed <laughs> and Pop were the two that I figured out would actually work for me um, in under 30 seconds. Um, and yeah, so I had a lot of fun light painting out there. And again, just kind of experimenting with the constraints of what we had. We had a, a Halloween harvest shoot um, with Ichabod Crane there. Um, yeah. I, I really love how these shots came out and just, I, I like showing the the cannabis plant in a different light than I think a lot of people normally have seen it um, and just making people think a little outside the box in terms of what, what a cannabis farm looks like. Um, so about four and a half years ago, I, once again, reinvented my life, moved from Smartsville up to Cascade Shores, bought a house with my wife up there um, and changed what we were doing. And my love of visual storytelling is part of what brought me to uh, my current job at Wild and Scenic Film Festival, um, which I started as a part-time worker with their tour program. Um, and so, you know, something like 65% of all internet traffic out there is video. Um, and that statistic has always struck me. And with that in mind, you know, it's easy to see why video is the preeminent dominant media form of our time and why, you know, the majority of people get most of their information in video format. Um, and that's part of what attracted me to Wild and Scenic Film Festival was how powerful and relevant this sort of storytelling is in the world um, that can, you know, sometimes feel a little more divided each day. And visual storytelling, and especially video, but photography as well, um, really has an incredible ability to cultivate empathy and compassion. Um, and that's what really draws me to visual storytelling. Um, so last few photos of mine, this is a scene from the Cambodian countryside, uh, that I passed through when we asked our tuk-tuk driver to take him to his farm. Uh, we'd been temple hopping around Angkor Wat all day and he was like, okay, which temple do you want to go to next? And we were like, can we see where you live? Can we, you talked about your farm. Can we go to your farm? Um, and he kind of looked at us like we were crazy and then was like, okay, I'll, I'll take you to my, my farm. Um, and that was some of the most powerful experience I had on that trip. And so while there's no substitute for firsthand experience, um, travel has a lot of barriers of entry and 
while I feel lucky to have grown up traveling um, and living abroad and continuing to get to do that into adulthood, uh, many people don't have that privilege. And that said, at this point, most people do have the access to a screen and to media. And so visual storytelling like film um, can really help break down barriers and transport viewers to new locations and cultures um, and in the press of the button. And, you know, inherent in that almost magical ability um, to transport people to new cultures um, is the ability to see, you know, their trials and tribulations, their successes, their failures, and to learn from them, to commiserate with them. Um, and to have a greater understanding of who those people are. And without that, it can be really hard sometimes for people from disparate locations across the globe to really understand where one another are coming from. Um, and real quick, if you haven't seen this in traveling in Southeast Asia, um, in Cambodia, <laughs> definitely along the roads, they're selling gasoline and used liquor bottles um, and so you know everyone's driving around in, in motorcycles and tuk-tuks and you get low on gas and they pull over just whatever one's there and take the gas and then put it into their tank um, so this was a scene that it was very common um, this is a scene from a temple outside of the Angkor Wat complex near the town of our tuk-tuk driver um, here a monk is going about his daily routine um, just outside of Angkor Wat main temple. And meanwhile, there's just like thousands of tourists not far away. Um, so I really liked the dichotomy of this, this shot, um, knowing that he was just going about his business, but there's such a scene nearby. Um, this shot, uh, you know, so while it's best practice technically to not support the local children hawking their wares around the temple because it discourages them from attending school, um, you know, I think this shot shows it's easy to see why many visitors fall victim to uh, their smiles and charm. Um, it's my wife receiving a blessing from a monk at the temple. Um, this is a, uh, boat, uh, a boat owner working on his boat, grinding it at night. So that's what the light is there, is flashes from him grinding his, his uh, propeller. Um, these long tail boats are kind of ubiquitous in Southeast Asia. And they're basically like a, a car engine attached to the back of these boats that's like out there with the propeller coming out of it. Um, so pretty powerful and ubiquitous. Um, but yeah, I, I love that power of storytelling and, you know, when I travel, I really enjoy capturing scenes like this where, you know, it, it might not be the brightest or sharpest, but it is what the feeling of that market in Chinatown and Bangkok felt like to me. Um, <laughs> it was five o'clock somewhere. At least. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is a turtle from Maui, I've got Maui on the line. Um, so, and then one of the, the things I love, you know, about taking photos on a trip is being able to tell these stories. Um, and so, you know, explaining the culture or environmental significance of the photo, like in this shot, um, in Thailand, they har they harvest bird nests from these high perches on cliffs, and they're like worth their weight in gold, basically, or more than their weight in gold. Um, and it's actually the saliva of these birds that makes these nests, um, and they're used in Chinese medicine and, and other you know uses. Um, and so there's these locations where these, these makeshift bamboo um, ladders or just rods tied to these cliffs. And this one's pretty low down, but sometimes they're just like hundreds of feet in the air. And, it, you know, there's like two of these bamboo rods hanging from a cliff. And it's for these climbers that climb up to harvest these bird's nests. Um, and it's a pretty interesting, interesting world. Um, they're like, 
there's times of year where you know there's technically permits and they're very guarded and you can stumble across an island with like an armed man protecting their birds' nests um, from from others. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, film serves as a really potent tool to educate and inspire activism and growth. And Wild and Scenic Film Festival is committed to offering programming that addresses environmental injustice, racism, inequity, um, as well as the lack of representation present in the outdoors and, and the environmental movements. Um, and so we welcome you to join us in this mission to help spread these important and timely stories to the world. Um, you know, visual storytelling is at the root of most films at Wild and Scenic. And some even have a really strong photograph, uh, you know, photography element to them. Uh, last year's winner is called The Path of the Panther. Anyone seen The Path of the Panther? It's nice. All right. Good. Uh, so it's a great film Nat Geo did um, about a project of theirs where they were um, capturing the Florida panther in a stretch of wild that's at risk from climate change and from development. Um, and they really go in depth showing you both the, the life of the panther as well as the life of the person documenting this panther and what they go through and how they, you know, have these camera traps set up and then, you know, there's a huge storm and their camera traps get flooded or, you know, just any number of things that go on uh, along the way. Um, and that's just one example of the kind of um, films that we, we have at Wild and Scenic. Um, so here's a little info and you can see a couple of the like choice shots came a bit. And one, I think the top one was the cover image for National Geographic um, and the story that came from that. Um, but they ended up getting some really brilliant images and telling a really compelling story for the presence of these uh, beautiful cats and the impact that proposed development have on them. Um, We call this area Gai Hayadet, Shimmering Waters. This is our home. Just like it's the home to the deer, the frogs, and the panther, <laughs> this is our home. This is the number one cause of death, right? Vehicle collision is number one in the last two weeks we've been here. We're going to reach a threshold where maybe we're already there for this little piece of land that's left for them. Florida Panthers once roamed the entire southeast, now mostly confined to just a small region along the Gulf of Mexico. These animals are like ghosts. It's so hard to show, <laughs> and you have to show people to create that connection, that love. Major coal highways running through some of our most high developed areas in Florida. There's only so many pieces of bones coal paradise left. It's been before my lifetime since the last female panther was documented north of the river. There's so much tracks. If we can show the world who that panther is, that's going to be the spark to save this whole corridor. <laughs> now we've got a category five, the only population of Florida panthers occurs right where this hurricane can come through. There's so much disappointment. Then there's this image of hope. If a big python is with me, will you come rescue me? I'll film it. <laughs> <laughs> the animals, they don't see these imaginary lines. They're trying to get to the areas that they knew. This island is the future of the wildlife. Have new generations of panthers being born here, bringing the system back into balance. This is it. This is nature's last stand. Somehow it's still here, like a seed waiting to be replanted. <laughs> panther is showing us it's not too late. There's no limit to the balance that we can bring back across this entire continent. <laughs> That uh, gives you a little taste of what we have going on at, uh, sorry about that, at Wild and Scenic Film Festival. 
Um, so I just want to encourage everyone to consider attending the festival. Um, it's a great chance to engage with other creatives in the space, both from near and far. Um, you know, we have filmmakers that are joining us from all around the globe. Um, and over the course of five days, you can really be exposed to a whole lot of different film and artwork, new ideas um, for how to shoot subjects or how to tell stories. Um, we've got workshops and panels um, and, of course, great films. Um, there's a lot of great ways to get involved uh, and even earn free access to film sessions through volunteering. Uh, that includes even festival photography, as well as ticket taking, tech support, um, filmmaker lounge roles where you get to interact with the, the creators um, and a lot more. Um, it's also a great chance to try your hand at event photography, um, as well as get a better idea of what event producers are looking for from photographers at events. Um, this could potentially help you, you know, improve your portfolio and better leverage your current work for other opportunities to shoot more events. Um, so I know plenty of friends and family who, you know, are photographers and over time have you know, seen a whole lot of free concerts or gone to a lot of events because they got into shooting, you know, musicians or something like that. And that's kind of their, their pathway to not having to spend quite as much money on their tickets. Um, and so, you know, along the way, we, we need help from photographers to capture these events. Um, and so I real quick <laughs> included... Uh, <laughs> I've included a, a real quick uh, list of shots just to give you a little idea of some of the things that, you know, an event producer like myself is looking for. Because um, I think a lot of times people have an idea, you know, like I was saying, even with concerts, when you go to a concert, you know, a lot of times photographers are really focused on just shooting the musician playing their instrument on stage. Um, but, you know, on the back end of things, there's a lot of need for everything in between. Um, and the same thing goes for the festival. Um, you know, we don't just need photos of everyone sitting in the theater watching film. We need, you know, photos of people out and about and people at the Enviro Fair, people getting interviewed at the media lounge, um, you know, people selling concessions because we ask for volunteers. And so that next year when we're asking, hey, do you want to volunteer to help us sell popcorn? We've got that fresh photo from the year before um, with someone selling popcorn. So um, I know, you know, it's maybe not as uh, illustrious as, you know, astrophotography or, or something like that, but it's still, uh, you know, it can be a, a great challenge in a way to stretch uh, your comfort zone and, you know, we help guide you along the way to show you what we need. Um, and so lastly, Wild and Scenic also provides an opportunity to exhibit your work and have it judged via the annual Wild and Scenic Art Exhibition. Uh, it's presented in collaboration with the Nevada County Arts Council. Um, I, we're in the teens this year. It's our 22nd annual festival. I want to say it's our 13th annual art exhibition, but don't hold it, hold me to that. Um, and there's usually a great, um, jury of quality judges, often at least one or two of those are gallery owners. So it can be a great chance to get your work in front of local or regional gallery owners. Um, and so, you know, this year's festival is President's Day weekend, February 15th through 19th. Um, and, you know, we're always looking for submissions that align with, you know, theme of environment. Uh, but, you know, especially this year, our theme is called Real Action, um, R-E-E-L, play on film reel. Um, and, it, you know, if you have sort of photographs that align with that in an uh, activism sense or really anything else, um, there's a wide range of photos that get submitted. Um, this is last year's art exhibition reception. Um, there's some drinks and bites to eat, and the award winners were announced by the jury. Um, and then I've included, and these are all shots taken, I think, by folks that are members of the club. Um, and 
<laughs> and so I just wanted to show a few examples before closing of past award winners. Um, so this was uh, last year's photography award winner. This was the judges award in photography last year. <laughs> Uh, this is the 2022 photography winner. And the 2022 best in the game. I guess in one more. I love this one. Uh, this is a judge's award from 2022. Um, so, yeah, I would love to, in the future, get to do this again and have some of your all's artwork up there listed. Um, so, please consider submitting your artwork. Uh, I think we're open through November, though the earlier you submit, the lower the submission um, price tag is, and all the funds from that go to support the South Beaver River Citizens League and continuing the Wild and Scenic Film Festival into the future. And uh, these postcards are available in the back by Barbara and Kathy. So if you want to grab one on the way out as a reminder, um, it's got all the information on there uh, in terms of submission dates and amounts. And head on over to wild and scenic film for more information. That's all I got. Thanks, everyone. We have time for a little QA if anyone wants to ask any questions about wild and scenic. Yeah. Oh. Kathy has a question. Do you know who the judges are this year? Um, so far, I know that Piper is back. Um, who, I'm blanking on her last name right now, but she has a gallery up in Truckee, and she was a judge last year. Uh, the other two are to be determined. The other two judges last year, it had been their second year in a row, and we try and switch it up after two years in a row if they take place. So. If you happen to know someone who would be a great judge for this art exhibition, please let me know. We've been putting word out and uh, hope to announce the other two soon. Anyone else? Questions? Well, if not, thank you, Eric, so much for sharing. That was really great. It was really fun to see the story of your progression through photography and then bringing us to Wild and Scenic. As he said, these cards are in the back. They do have the information about the submissions, the fees, all of that. Just also some cool stickers. So make sure to visit the table. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that is it. So um, thank you, Eric. And we will have our uh, intermission now and uh, for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And then we'll be back for our sharing moment and critique. Thank you very much. Our new or this day, we do what's called a sharing moment, and we have two volunteers from the club um, present one of the photographs and tell the story behind it. Tonight we have a Shelley Carlisle. And Jim Bear. Shelly, Mana. Hi, everyone. So I'm a new member, newish, but it's really wonderful to be a part of this rich and talented community. Really having fun. So I'm just going to read from my notes because there's just a few things I want to say. So <clears throat> imagine. Hold on. Can I get my glasses? <laughs> Imagine in this iconic destination, Teton National Park, that you have spotted this majestic animal and you are alone, enjoying your moose watching and communing and casually taking photos with plenty of time and space. Scratch that. And that was not the scene when I got this photo. <laughs> now imagine about 25 to 35 cars, trucks, RVs, etc. Parked haphazardly along the side of the road, 
People are running with their camera of choice, many with large prime and zoom lenses, but I can't see what they are chasing yet. I pull over knowing this must be a special animal because of the amount and energy of people darting around. So I park off the road, grab my camera with attached zoom lens and rush off toward the other people when I finally see the moose. He's the younger guy walking with a quick gait along a creek side. The horde of photographers, including me, follow him in parallel, a safe distance away, trying to keep up. It's a game of people leapfrog, people leapfrog, trying to get ahead and get a shot of him walking towards us or past us. So for me, tired of getting butt shots, <laughs> I race back to my car, along with a few other people, to drive up the road ahead of the moose. Making sure I don't hit any mesmerized people standing in the road, I drive several hundred feet up the road, park again, and wait for the moose to walk by. The sun is setting and the light is gorgeous. I get the shot. I hear a photographer close to me with a large prime lens say, shit, I'm too close. As, as the moose passes by. <laughs> that that really happened. Uh, once more, I get in my car, get ahead of the moose to get some photos as he is walks towards a group of us. But this was my favorite photo because of the light on the horns and because he was in focus. <laughs> I left the scene with a feeling of great joy and satisfaction, but also sadness, as this is often the only way a lot of people get to see magnificent animals in the wild. We were the moose paparazzi, and I imagine it's annoying having people running after you to get a good shot. <laughs> hey, so uh, those of you that have uh, known me for uh, 10 or 14 years have been a member of the club know that I like to do something different. So here we have fabulous landscape photography, wildlife photography and everything. And what do I have building? So, um, but it was a bit of a uh, opportunistic experience. I went down to uh, Long Beach, California uh, to attend a meeting and uh, took my camera and thought, um, well, you know, there's, there's boats, there's beach, you know, there's uh, lighting opportunities, especially early in the morning. So I wandered down to the beach and it was just kind of dismal. In fact, they, I would have had to switch over to industrial photography because as you might know, there are great shipyards on uh, Long Beach. So I'm just kind of walking along and then I turned around and looked back the direction I came from and there were these uh, buildings. And uh, I'm one of those people who tends to like old buildings and the beautiful, interesting architecture of what you might call the past. And uh, this new building was kind of dominating the landscape and represented the direction the Long Beach is going. And I kind of wanted both because it's, it's a story about what's going on. And then I noticed this reflection and um, I, I just got the biggest kick out of calling this, uh, and I'm going to make sure I use the current title, um, Ben Glass, The Old and the New. And if you, if you look closely, you can see the distortion that's from the glass in the new building. And I, I just love that kind of artistic uh, spin on it. I also noticed as I uh, took this into um, Lightroom and Photoshop will work on it a little bit, that um, it violated one of the rules. And that is that there really wasn't a center of interest. But then I thought, well, uh, what about if I make sure that little rooftop is up there? And I don't know if your eyes end up up there, but there's a good opportunity because of the, the way the lines lead. So anyway, um, I have, enjoyed this picture an awful lot and uh, submitted it to the state fair and was very very happy to uh, win first place in architecture and uh, then i submitted it to the county fair and won second place <laughs> i think they're just tougher here <laughs> anyway 
There you are. Old in the new. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you um, for sharing. Um, and again, if you are interested in sharing some of your work, do talk to Rick Eshelman um, to ask about how to become part of the sharing moment. It's very fun to hear the stories behind some of these uh, great photos. So, oh, that's right. Yes. And for September, because of the member series month, um, Amari mentioned we're not having a critique, but we are also not doing the sharing moment. That will take a break. For the month of September. So moving into uh, this, these are the um, these are the uh, winners of the different categories from last month. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, they're like talking. Oh, okay. I couldn't tell if that was the feedback yeah, of the mic. Yeah, that's only... <laughs> okay. So for our science subject, which was um, transportation, we have men at work. Uh, Jimmy Marchio. And then next. For our abstract category, we have defocused firework, Allison Colt. Architecture, the Coliseum in Rome, Jonathan Beck. Fauna, we have the family portrait, David Wong. Laura, not forgotten to lips, Fred Finney. Natural landscape, Arctic mirror, Janice Rosner. Night photography, St. Mark's Square before dawn, Brian Dunbar. For people, the birds, Emily Weissman. Uh, our journalism category, Street Chess, San Francisco, uh, Daniel Chaplin. Travel, Cormorant, Fisherman on the Lee River, Paul King. Uh, in our creative category, triple exposure of scarves, Mike Shea. Uh, manipulated but realistic, we have Mary Go Round, Jonathan Beck. Black and white, trumpet player, Robert Arnold. And color, visiting the Dahlians, Bob Freed. Uh, and for our uh, phone category, Mill Creek Falls, South Warner Wilderness. Daniel Chaplin. So please give a round of applause to your um, Thank you to all who submitted. And so now we will move into our critique. And one second while I get my list here. Hey, Grace? Yeah. I want to say something first. Okay. Uh, Frank, go ahead. Mm -hmm. and we'll, oh, here we go. Cool. Hi, everybody. I'm Frank. And um, so if you don't want, know me, I think Barbara will tell you that I'm the short Brad Pitt. So <laughs> if, you, if you have any, any concerns about remembering me. Um, you know, I forget everything at home. Or, you know, my mother used to say if I didn't have my head screwed on, I'd get it going. And it's really true. So before I, I came here, I made sure I had everything. So I made sure I had my computer. I made sure I had global radio computer. I made sure I had the chip that has the PDF <laughs> that has all my notes that I took hours making 11 pages of notes. <laughs> and then don't laugh yet. <laughs> and so I opened up my PDF, it's one page long. So I don't have any notes. I forgot my notes, even though I did everything. So I apologize in advance for how bad I'm going to be. But oh. the pictures are really good. <laughs> oh, okay. thank you, Frank. I'm sure that it's going to be fine. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll just keep going. We'll roll with it. <laughs> but thank you, Frank. Uh, all right. Well, we're going to get started um, with our assigned subject. And by the way, it was flash photography, and we had one entry in this. So I sense that, you know, maybe we could all be pushing ourselves a little bit. But um, here it is flash shots. Is here? Is it on? Test, 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 test. No, it's on. Thank you. 
No, you turned The off. origins of this photo are enigmatic and fanciful, like a scene from a time travel movie where there is a stage press for a selfie from the 50s. It's set in the black and white past, of course, and all the graphics camera flashes are impossibly firing at once. The image is well composed with the most intrepid of our reporters front and center. Don't forget the perfect touch of the guy almost hidden in the lower left with the little boy ponder, capturing the same scene as the big boys. This photo is pe peculiar and baffling and wonderful. Almost. And the artist is Robert Arnold. Moving into abstract, we also had just one entry here, uh, hypnosis. I'm a real fan of abstract photos. And the more time I can spend with the photo, the happier I am. And when I look at this, I, I would think to myself, is it ice or is it feathers? Well, I think it's ice, but they, but they look like feathers. And so I find that absolutely fascinating. The more you, more I look deeper and deeper into the photo, I see, see more and more patterns. I guess that's fractals, I don't really know. Um, I find it absolutely delightful. They spend so much time with it. Uh, you know, the, so the composition, I guess, is simple enough to find the right space and you can shoot it. Um, the lighting is perfect. It's, it's just an absolutely delightful photograph. Thank you so much for that. The artist is Tom Quinn. In architecture, first one is all in a row. While this image is accurately placed in the architecture category, it would also fit comfortably in the abstract category, and that's a good thing. I love the earth tones of this image with its gradients and shadows and its geometric forms and simplicity. The composition was finally chosen to give perspective and depth, and the tonality of deep blacks to bright whites adds interest. Nice photo. And the artist is Bernadette Sylvester. Next. We have a Roman theater in Merida, Spain. This building is, I understand, about 2,000 years old. The fact that it's still standing is quite remarkable. If you move back way back, there's a lot more to this building, and there's lots of steaming around. It's like always something like 6,000 people or some crazy people like that. The heart of this photograph, I think, is simply showing the intricacies and the beauty and the strength of this ancient, ancient building. Um, I love the, the statues, the statues down there. I want to point something out. Uh, excuse my fancy little writing thing here. If you shoot from the corner up to the other corner from below, you're going to, because of the physics of the lens, you're going to get some funky lines. The perspective is very weird. So to check this out, you got this line that's going this way, but these guys are going the other direction. And so that hurts the photograph, I'm sorry to say. Oh, my minute is up apparently. <laughs> um, anyway, that hurts the photograph. So if you move more to the center, you won't get that effect. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, that was, the artist was um, Gary Emanuel. Next, we have a day at the museum. This is another wonderful abstract architectural image that has a firm foundation in geometric forms. It's not clear if this image is just natively black and white or whether it was converted, but it doesn't matter because that is part of the chemistry. The composition is the curve and the overlapping patterns make for a magical effect, like interfering ripples of the fuel infused with the physics of rectangles. The image encompasses rich blacks to glowing whites and the crazy. Very nice. And the artist is Ellen Davis. All right, next category, fauna. First up, three toed sloth. Supermodel sloth. I mean, you know, when you come to get the sloth to take that pose. <laughs> Um, that that's an absolutely lovely photograph. I photographed slots before, and I remember had a shot like that. Um, the lighting is just absolutely lovely. The photific view base of the slot. Um, you see the three toes. You know that is a three toed slot. The bokeh in the back is really really beautiful. It's really hard to get a shot with a background like that and the dark foreground, but 
Uh, the topic that pulls it off, that is really an excellent photograph. Thank you so much. The artist is Connor Gotha. Next, we have Ruggedly Handsome. I like how the grass seeds echo the color and movement of the lion's mane, and I love the anthropomorphic tough guy expression in the lion's face. I'll add the possibly sexist notion that the stars add character to his visage. <laughs> I'm debating whether the centeredness of the composition detracts a little from the image. I think I fall on the side that it does. I think the composition would be more effective if some was cropped off the left side and maybe a little off the top. It would help to elevate the image from feeling like a terrific snapshot to being fine art. Uh, artist is Bill Wages. Next, we have White Lion Sphinx Moth 5. I don't think I've ever seen a white, what is it? The, the Sphinx Moth, that, that's really, really quite remarkable. Um, I, I really like this diagonal angle that works really beautifully. I think that this has been cropped in quite a bit, I may be wrong, um, so as to show us the moth more. With the moth being the subject and the story there, and the tongue sticking way out in an amazing way, unfortunately, then the flower is hidden. And I think that really hurts the shot. Now, you get the shot that you get. I mean, you can't ask the moth to hang out with a beautiful leaf. So um, it, it's really, really nice. It's just a shame that leaf is in the way. Thank you. Uh, the artist is Fred Fossums. Next, we have twin swallowtails. This image would be an impressive start for an Audubon painting to show the beauty and the form of the swallowtail butterfly as a plate in a book. We see both sides of the wings as well as the body and antenna of the insects and a typical flower they might keep from. The depth of field was chosen skillfully to separate the flowers and butterflies from the background while mostly retaining sharpness through both of these little beauties. I think a slightly closer composition with a little crop around all sides would improve the image and would also eliminate the distracting blue patch in the upper right. It is a very fine image. The artist is Bob Free. Next, we have nap time between meals. Wow. This is a fine photograph. There's danger lips. When you're not expecting, I think it's the message. Think about this photograph. It's a good message. And as, as we look at the at the leopard's face, it's pretty well hidden. Fortunately, you can see the body really well. And check out these needles. Holy cow! <laughs> um, and so this is this is a really good example of telling a story in a photograph. And, and, and check out the superb depth of field. You've got the front out of focus, you've got the tree in focus, you've got the leopard in focus, and then behind out of focus. Really well done. Artist is David Nelson. Next, Sally Lightfoot. The vivid colors and the crisp sharpness of the crowd are the best parts of this image, along with the composition that creates a diagonal and a little perspective on the creature. I might have hoped for just a little more space between the left leg and the border on the lower left, and I might have eliminated the distracting red spots in the center left, but those are minor possible improvements to a great image. The artist is Dave Connell. Next, new watering system, a aquifer. <laughs> I really love this photograph. Um, it's it's really photojournalistic, isn't it? That bird is hot, and it has to be cooled <laughs> off, and it's getting cooled off, and the I don't know about the anthropomorphic guy is going ah. That feels so much better. It may not be maybe screaming or something, but just the same. The the water shows up beautifully. It's a typical photo. I don't know how I get that water so. Well. <laughs> But anyway, it just tells a lovely story, and that's what we want to do. Also, just from the from the technical perspective, look at the diagonal. Beautiful, very very nicely done. Artist is Aaron Wesley. Next, I just ate a zebra. Leave me alone. <laughs> I'm happy that we get to see all these lions tonight. While there is some humor in this image, it embodies more than that. 
and each has sufficient depth of field to make everything about the life of the field. We're not sure where that came from. Is it me? Is it you? I don't know. You're off now. Right now. <laughs> okay, so we'll try that and then we'll get back to my team. Oh, it's not me. Ah. It's not me. <laughs> Sorry. No. It's, is it Chris? Chris, it's Chris. <laughs> I can get you this. This mic. Uh, okay. Okay. We'll, we'll sorry, everyone. We're going to keep going. Let's try it again. <clears throat> the image has sufficient depth of field to make everything about the lion dark, but blurs the background to create separation. The photographer also captured an alert and intriguing expression on the lion's face, and the cloudy weather means that the colors of the mane and fur are nicely saturated. If the main intention of the image was for humor value, then as good as it stands, I can add increased interest if the photographer might choose a less centered composition. The artist is John Siebert. Next, stay out of my pool. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, so am, am I on? Yeah. yeah. How about now? Can you all hear me? Uh, you're on here. I can't. Okay, so I'm on. Yeah. Right. All right. So this is a lovely minimalist picture. It's a portrait of a water horse, a hippo. And when do you get to take a portrait of a hippo? Um, the diagonal again tells a beautiful story of bringing us into the center where the uh, the hippo spaces. But note note the water. How you can see that the hippo is turning to look at the photographer. I'm not sure I want to be that photographer that way. Um, and check out the whiskers. It's a beautiful story and and portrait of this creature that you know people don't get near. Just just so very very well done. Thank you. Artist is David Nelson. Next, hiding from the orcas. Test test good. Although it will look a little better on the bright screen here in the room, it actually looks pretty good. Uh, on my calibrated monitor, I, this image was way too dark. Um, but I'll critique it, assuming that the brightness looks like it does in the room. Uh, uh, this image captures a pleasant, intimate moment between seals as satisfactorily composed to mostly frame just the seals' faces. Although I think cropping the right 20% of the image will improve the composition further. Finally, the glow of a low sun gives pleasing highlights to the image. Thanks for sharing. The artist is Janice Rosner. Next up, I dare you. So this is a horror story. <laughs> <laughs> um, when, I, when I turn this, uh, this photo on in, on my computer, I just saw the, the elephants and I thought, oh, how cute. And they are, they're also cute in there. There's in this interesting color, so beautiful. And then my eyes dropped and I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> um, the way that the photographer says, lick a lion makes us know that, you know what, as we said before, danger works in all sorts of funny ways. Now, actually, I suspect that elephants babies don't run around by themselves. And there's some massive people oh, go by real nearby that are going to keep them keep them safe from mean old lions. This is a really, really interesting story and very well done. Thank you so much. Artist is Bill Wages. Next we have goats <laughs> in trees. <laughs> I once read that paleontologists would do well to keep goats in mind, because if one was studying the fossil bones of goats, there would be nothing to suggest that they regularly climb trees. <laughs> this is a whimsical capture of the unexpected, with the goats looking like they have a combination of amusement and superiority on their faces. <laughs> I found that I like a vertical composition that frames just the left three goats much better by cropping the right 40% of the photo where there isn't as much going on, and maybe a little off the left too. 
Again, this would help elevate the photo from a snapshot to art. Great shot. Artist is Patricia Levitan. Uh, next, we have Impala with Elephant. Gorgeous. Simply, simply gorgeous. I don't know that I've ever seen an elephant use as a background. <laughs> like that. Um, but, you know, it's so nice and soft. And we all know what's an elephant. But just the same, the Impala stands out so very, very well. Look at the way that Impala is lit. The, the sharpness of the fur and the, the curves of the um, of the horns, putting the Impala's eye right there in the center is such an interesting choice. You have so much more, so much space for the Impala to zip if the background decides to say hi. Um, it, it, it's absolutely gorgeous. The artist is David Wong. Next. And the last one in this category is getting crowded. <laughs> I love the Hitchcockian feel of this image, with the unsettling off-kilter cables in front of the reverse off-kilter diagonals of greenery. There is something horrible and inexplicable about so many birds and such a tight frame. Most of them black, with only a few bloody patches of red winged blackbird showing. I suspect this image is a collage, and this photographer might have put it more properly in the creative category of fairness, but it's still a puzzling and awesome image. And artist is Jerry Thomas. Moving into our flora category, first one up is Blowing in the Wind. I'm confused by this photograph. Honestly, blowing in the wind would indicate that there would be some movement, but I don't see him. Um, so I'm not sure what's occurred. I think maybe the photographer shot this really fast so as to freeze the um the movement. The subject, I think, is is these is the flowers that are really beautiful, um, but they're out of focus. And I, I suspect what's happening, if you look right here, you see that's in focus. And so what I suspect has happened is that the wind has blown the flowers away and, and that leaf into the into the focus spot. And that's that's rough. That's that's tough to get. It's really tough to shoot in the wind like that. You need to use an autofocus setting that will capture a larger area and have deeper depth of field to pull that off, as well as this picture was trying to be. Also, one last note to that beautiful curve. Across the middle, it's really nice. It's a beautiful drive. And the artist is Sheila Ryan. Next, we have Wax Gills. This is a quite good composition of an unusual growth of mushrooms. I like the brilliant red color of the caps, the radiant orange of the stems, and the bright white of the gills. The photographer captured a wide variety of shapes from tiny to large and short to tall. The image might have been improved by employing a wider depth of field so that the mushrooms are in focus front to back or by using focus stacking. Overall, a very appealing image. The artist is Hannah Baba. Next, I might mispronounce this, but um, I'll try. Baobab's Bow Sunset Glow. So I sure do love me some sunset silhouettes of weird trees. And, um, Baobabs are really beautiful trees. Um, I love the way that this, the, the front tree and then the back tree with the sun in the background, a lovely line that really works for a fantastic composition. I'm thinking that maybe it would have told the story of these trees in the sun a little bit better if the camera had been pointed down a bit, a bit more. It feels like we're kind of high up on the, uh, on the trunks at the bottom. And then we would have lost some of that upper uh, branch stuff there that, that is distracting to me. Um, I don't much care about that. That doesn't really distract me. Most people would say get rid of it. Um, but that up there bugs me. Um, it's, but ignoring that, this is gorgeous. And I have it on in front of you. And the artist is David Wong. Next, we have a memory of spring. We are so lucky here in the foothills to have that marvelous combination of orange poppies and purple lupine. 
which the photographer has skillfully captured together in this image. The pale blues of the sky and the patchy grays of the clouds also make for a superb background. I can't help but feeling like there might have been better compositions for the photographer to explore in this scene, perhaps isolating smaller groups of poppy and lupine and lowering the camera even further to capture the flowers better against the sky instead of partially against the green. Thanks for sharing. And the artist is Kathy Triola. Next, we have Happy Spring Cactus. This is a really rare site. Um, these cactus, I don't even know if they blossom every year. Um, the story of the cactus having spring and beautiful blossoms is just, it, it, it's just visceral for me. It shows life coming from more well, pretty harsh circumstances. I mean, the, the cactus is in a very difficult place. Um, the red with the, what, I don't know, color that is impatient, and the green. And the diagonal going up, it, it, it tells that story right off the cactus. Uh, just really lovely. Thank you. The artist is Brian Dunbar. Next, uh, maple leaf on water. This is a well composed image of a textured leaf floating on water. The leaf is closely and adeptly framed with the axis of the leaf on a good diagonal. I like how the surface tension of the water around the edge of the leaf distorts the light and makes glowing marks. The photo feels a little flat to me, both in terms of contrast and saturation. Yeah. By increasing both contrast and saturation and warming the image temperature, I found that I like this image even more. Good photo. The artist is Dave Conn. Next, we have up close and personal. To me, the story of this photo, part of this photo, is a life in abundance. And it really tells that it's, it's chaos in, in life, but, but it's beautiful that all the all the, the grasses are headed the same direction. I don't know how that happened. So, so the, the leaves are just pointing off to the, the diagonals. And, and I could spend all sorts of time. It, it, it seems like an abstract. It's clearly, it's clearly flat life. Um, it's, uh, I can stay out. Thank you so much. And the artist is Arne Pursar. Uh, next, we have Autumn Comes in August. The backlit and saturated reds, greens, and yellows of the leaves are fantastic in this photo, especially against the black background. The dried blooms make for an excellent textural contrast with the leaves. And the depth of field was skillfully chosen to give sharpness in the image front to back. The image falters a bit on the bottom leaf where contrast is lost and the distracting whiteness surfaces. The photographer might either crop the bottom in order to keep the frame only on the middle two leaves or alternately locally increase the contrast and saturation of the bottom leaf so that it better matches the others. Great colors. Artist is Tom Quinn. And finally, in this category, we have Pink Dreams. Well, it seems to me that the heart of this photograph is truly a mythical, mystical um, picture for us to go float into. And I think we can completely support that. Um, the washed out look works wonderfully for creating that fantasy type. One thing that I'm really enjoying here, like, really works is if you look on the right if you look on the right the dark greens makes a heavy look and one would think that that would overpower the, the lightness on the right but it doesn't because the right on the left, it should be on the left with the left there's it's so much more there's so much brighter and the colors are so beautiful that it just evens it out really well done the artist is janice rosner <clears throat> Moving into our natural landscape category. First, we have Isabella Island in Galapagos. At first glance, this photo seems to have serious issues with resolution, as if it's a very small crop of a larger photo, but I'm going to go with it as is, as if the graininess is intentional. The low resolution, low contrast, and desaturation of the top 60% of the image has the beautiful texture and feel of a watercolor painting. Unfortunately, the bottom 40% of the image has high contrast and higher saturation, 
and the two parts of the image don't really work together. I suggest cropping off the bottom 50% of the image or reworking the bottom so that it might better match the quite nice impressionism of the upper part of the image. The artist is Gary Emanuel. Next, moon rising over Donner Lake at dawn. Well, the early bird guests that are advising the moon over the Donner, I mean, that is really lovely. Uh, the artificial light in front to give us a foreground and we make the open mid ground taking us to the the lake straight in a lovely line with the horizontal oranges and then the, the moon tells a beautiful story of a beautiful place and takes us through it. I'm not sure we need as much of the sky there as we have, but um, that's a good the choice of the product for me. It, it's it's just a lovely clear photo or a cheesy story that makes me want to be there. The artist is George Papel. Next, windy winter day at Marshall's Beach. This photograph is a great example where one might ask, what are the important parts of the image? The bridge, of course, and the low sky, and the rocks in the surf, and the street preceding water on the sand. All of these are essential elements. Looking at the lower right area of the image, there are no essential elements, and the rocks touching the edge are distracting. I tried cropping some off the right side and off the bottom, and the image immediately snapped to a better composition and was more compelling to my eye. The photographer might give this a try to improve an already excellent image. And the artist is Brian Dunbar. Next, we have Never Ending Story. I don't know if you're like me, but I love wide open spaces. And so it really does it does it for me. I, I, I think it takes as close as the story of getting on that river and just going and floating and it's very, very soothing. But there's all those birds that are from that other photo that are looking to terrorize us. So <laughs> there's there's danger everywhere, even in the most serene, lovely place. <laughs> I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> the artist is Eleni Poussin. Next, we are headed into the Aspens. This photo is a great example of how to tell a story simply and effectively. The composition is effective, and the colors of the Aspen and sky are pleasing. We can almost feel the horse rocking below us and smell that pleasant balsam smell of the Aspens as we approach. If the, if the photographer has the tools and skills to locally darken the dirt of the road around the horse's head, they could make this photo even more admirable. Thanks for taking this along on the ride. The artist is Monica Hughes. Next, Journey to the West. <laughs> so this is a metaphorical story to me. I think that those, the rocks there, the, the pile of rocks there are our family. And that they're looking at the river, and because it's it's metaphorical, the the long um, exposure really really works. But for me, this photo means something a little bit different. Like right? I don't have a good relationship with the river. Um, our family, we have my myself and my wife and our two kids. So there's the four, but there was a fifth. It was our sister in law who moved up here to be with us, and we lost her to the river. So that those four are missing the four. It's a beautiful photograph that let me have, have a really sad moment hmm. that I'm reliving right now. Um, thank you. The artist is Alan Davis. Next, we have Keyhole Rock at Low Tide. I'd like to talk about this photo as an exercise in composition. The two most interesting elements to my eye or the keyhole and the strand of seaweed, along with the misty water. While these elements are not centered, they are nearly so, and a more interesting composition might have been found by taking a step to the left to put the keyhole and seaweed on a diagonal in <laughs> front. The photographer might have also taken a small step forward to help eliminate as much as possible the unimportant rocks at the bottom of the frame. 
Also, as long as you're moving the photographer around, <laughs> they could have raised the height of the camera and might also include more of the misty water. Finally, a little vignette might help improve the final image. Thanks. The artist is David Bauer. Uh, next, Sunrise, Sun Star. The Sun Star is just about as good as one could be. Uh, and that the sky is spectacular. My first view was the landscape was too busy to go with the view of the sky and then takes it away. But then I realized I was, I was wrong. Um, this is a photograph of a place. And that place had that landscape, which is really beautiful. And it's got the wonderful water going at the bottom there, saying this is dying of a new day. And um, it's the story of the day starting in a beautiful place and a beautiful sky and beautiful sunset. Fantastic. Thank you. The artist is Bob Cree. Next, we have three brothers, reflection in Merced River. This Yosemite photo has an outstanding composition and execution. Note how the snowy shoreline echoes the granite peaks in the opposite corner, and how the reflection of the peaks and sky sits nicely between the two, adding an opposing diagonal. The stark tree silhouettes fill out the upper right corner and echo the bright white leaves in the center left. The full depth of field means the photo is sharp throughout. Finally, it's a Yosemite scene I haven't seen before. About the only suggestion I might make to include this already remarkable photo is to add a touch of vignetting. Very nice. And the artist is John Siebert. Just a couple more left in this category. Uh, this one is Sunset at Loch Levin's Lake. So sweet, right? This is a story telling a story of a lovely place with someone enjoying a serene moment. So you have the man sitting on the rock, cross-legged, having a nice morning train, bathed in that beautiful sunlight. That's fabulous. I'm um, looking over the lake. Some people might say, well, crop the top or do some things, but I, I, I don't think any of that is necessary. I think this story, this story tells the story of the man in the serene light, and it just takes me there. Thank you so much. All right, see Emily Weissman. Uh, and last one in this category, Blowing in the Wind 2. This photo has a good composition with the offset wave of water, and I like the silhouette of the leaves against the white of the water, as, as well as the choice of black and white. However, I can't find much in the photo that is sharp or in focus. While this might have been done for artistic effect, I don't think it works very well in this case. Finally, the dark distracting leaf in the lower left should be cropped out of the photo. I encourage the photographer to go try the same scene again with more attention to achieving sharper focus. And the artist is Sheila Bryan. All right, moving into night photography. First up, August 2023, Mercedes meteor shower over Donner Lake in California. So the story of this photograph is Frank, stop being so lazy, get out and take the shot, right? Um, because I didn't go. And this is what I and all of the rest of you missed getting. Um, this is wonderful. The the lake in the in the lower corner just gives uh, grounds the photograph, it gives us a place to look from, not needed at all. And I look at the colors in those meteorites. That is a lovely photograph. Well done. Thank you so much. And the artist is George Paul Pell. Next, Orion and Venus, Badwater, Death Valley. This is an astonishing and extraordinary photograph that moves my desert soul. It's not just the skill it took to execute, but it's a view that is unique to my eye. I love the fractal branching of the water channels into the distance and the subtle salt stains that look like the patterns of the earth from high altitude. The image combines math and wonder and the far burning flares in the firmament. I wish for winds to fly through this infinite dream forever. Fantastic. And the artist is Fred Finney. Next up, Portree Arbor. So this is Scotland, I do believe. Um, 
And what and I see the, the story of this photo as being a, an exercise in showing repeating shapes and colors and lights and, and, and there's different levels. And it really is successful in doing that. My eyes just follow the lines of, of the houses and I just keep going around and around and around. It's so much fun. And what's really good, I think here beyond merely that, is in the bottom right corner, that's a mess. And the photographer has not solved that mess. It's a, it's in the place. And um, I mean, if I take it out, we've been spending hours cleaning it up and we've been wrong. This is a superb photograph. Thank you so much. And the artist is Mike Shea. Uh, next, Rainbow Color Bridge. The heart of this photo is the water reflections that look like a hundred rockets launching from the shoreline in the distance. The technical aspects of the photo are well executed and the lights of the city are captured without being blown out. The star patterns of the bridge lights are particularly good. The elephant in the room of this photo is the cement dock in the lower left, which is an element that to my eye needs mitigation to make this photo completely whole. I tried cropping some off the left and hard darkening of what was left, and I found that it significantly improved an already good image. And the artist is Mike Weitzman. And last in night photography, we have nocturne fireworks and a boat. It's like a watercolor minimalist. How much I love my fireworks photo. Um, the, the story is so interesting to me. We don't know really anything about the person in the boat except uh, they're posting us fireworks in the flower. Um, and the, the, the way that the light is done, the, the lights with a how bright and clear and they are, and then the reflection, it's eerie, it's low res, it, it's so ambiguous that it lets me just fantasize about what's going on there. I really enjoy this. And the artist is Jonathan Beck. All right, we're into people category here, uh, starting with two runner page. Watch what your eyes do when viewing this image. They circle from face to picking hand to fretting hand and back around. Maybe they expand the circle to include tattoo and tuning machines, the wood grain shadows on the back wall, and of course the glowing thighs at the bottom and on around in circles. The tonality of the image is outstanding and the photographer <laughs> skillfully captured the performer without a microphone or other stage necessities blocking her. This is a brilliant image of a fascinating subject. The artist is Mike Shea. Next, getting warmer. <laughs> I think that the story here is this has a neighbor. <laughs> he's not close he's next to him, but he's just simply um, <laughs> The photographer chose to leave enough so we can see that it's, it's magic carpet, so we know we're on Broad Street, right? That's on Broad Street. Right? Um, and the blue goes with the coldness. But I just keep coming back to the, the look on the guy's face, and he's not all there. Um, <laughs> it's really good. I mean, it tells a beautiful story. It's, it's funny and, and it's odd. Just great photo. <laughs> the artist was Jerry Thomas. Next up, Generation X Gallery, New York. This is an appealing portrait that works well for several reasons. The posing for movement helps tell the story of progress and solidarity with the subjects moving together toward us. The choice of black and white simplifies the image to what is important, which are the people and the path separated from the background. Including writing in an image usually means that the writing dominates and that it is small, but in this case, it's more of a badge that is being worn and adds to the story. The black frame and the white stroke border are unnecessary, in my opinion, and a little distracting in this context. Otherwise, I think this is a remarkable photo. The artist is Shelby Cohen. Next up, leader of the pack. <laughs> I have no idea what to say. <laughs> um, so, this is a joke. 
<laughs> but I don't know who this is, and I don't know what the joke means. So I'm just at a loss, but I have to tell you, I did enjoy it. It is odd, and it's funny. Does anybody know who this person is? Are we supposed to know? I, I, I don't know. And so all those questions that I have take me into, into the photo, take me into the strange story that the photo is, is, is telling. And um, yeah, no, thanks. Well, we can ask Bill Hoffman if he knows. He's the artist. Thank you very much. And next, this guy pulled out a gun. Toma Nora Japan. I like how the photographer did a good job of framing this intriguing subject. One of the swords and the shadow resonate in parallel lines and interact with the stripes of the pants and the lines in the background, though I suspect this was serendipity. The pleasant expression on the subject's face amplifies the humor of the portrait, and in case anyone missed it, this photo is an excellent allusion to the Indiana Jones scene where he pulls out a pistol instead of using his whip. Thanks very much. Artist is Rachel Rosenthal. Next, Honeymoon and Big Sur. This supposed portrait, um, I, apparently a honeymoon in, in, in Big Sur. This will serve this couple for their lives together, as long as that goes on. Um, and it's a, it'll be a lovely memento. Check out the, 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 the lovely um, patterns with their shadow and the river going on through, taking us all the way through up into the right corner and representing their lives together. And um, it's just a really nice photograph, the, the, the post photograph for, for Hollywood shot. Well done. And the artist is Dave McClellan. Next, we have artist. This is a pleasing, candid portrait of the child. I like how the subject is concentrating hard on what she's coloring. The subject is well-framed in the composition and the colors are natural. Unfortunately, the image looks like it was taken in low light, so the photo is grainy and possibly there was camera and subject movement. That's more evident in looking at a larger version of it. The portrait might also have been improved by directing the subject to look up into the camera so that both viewer and subject might be more engaged. Thanks for sharing. And the artist is Gary Kutzstaffner. Um, next, Inanna Yuba Nu. This, in my estimation, is a spectacular photograph. The story is difficult to tell. Our model, she's older, she's very thin, the way she's holding her head, I don't know if she's in tremendous distress or if she's just setting herself stuck in the neck, but I suspect distress. She's taking herself away from the river into a, a more hidden type spot. It, the, the diagonal line of the rock and the texture of the rock as compared to the texture of her skin is, is amazing. The, the lighting on her back is simply exquisite. I don't know how one could do better lighting and a better treatment of that, of that. Then you've got our uh, the line of rock and dirt going up the river and showing us where she's at in this environment. But really, if you live in the bottom right corner, uh, this is a museum quality photograph in my estimation. It's simply a The artist is Shelby Cohen. And last one for people happy 81st birthday, Jerry Garcia. The best part of this image is that the photographer captured the perfect moment of joy and exhilaration on the subject face and in her pose. It speaks loudly that it's a good day to be alive. I like the black and white treatment of the photo, which simplifies the image to the essential portrait. And I like how the photographer caught the subject against a mostly dark background. While some of the highlights are a bit blown out, it's almost impossible to compensate camera settings when snapping a transitory moment such as this. What delight. And the artist is Emily Weissman. Now we're into photojournalism. Just a few entries here. First one is Milk in it. So the story here is, well, Milk in I guess it goes. I don't think that's a cow saying that. Or a dog or a horse, or whatever, but um, 
And the reason I say that is that the, that the atom is so fucked up that we don't really have its, uh, a relationship with it. We don't have a relationship with the girl because she's so well hidden. You can't even really see her in Milton. The relationship there is holding the legs so we don't get kicked. Okay, I'll get that loud and clear. Um, it, it seems like the subject of the photograph is this shiny bucket. I don't think it is. So to me, the, the, the photograph misses the story, the subject. I, 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 I don't want to it. And our artist is Gary Parks Dafner. Next, committed to the line. This is an extraordinary photojournalistic image. The main bike riding subject is perfectly captured, but the thing that takes this photo to the next level is capturing all of the spectators and other, and other photographers as part of the scene. There's almost a claustrophobic feeling to how close everything seems to be around the rider, and this is a good thing. In addition, the dusty air adds to the mood of the photo. The only fault is the distracting bright green in the lower right, which could be mitigated by local darkening and desaturation. Well done. And artist is Mike Weitzman. Next, we have Santa Monica High School, Zach Finney, 2009. Difficult photograph to take. I mean, the lighting is better than terrible. Um, the action is moving very, very quickly. The story is the guy in it. Um, and we anticipate that ball coming down. And that's the story is so strong because we really do anticipate that ball coming down. The the player is still going up and we're going to have a spike. That is really cool. Um, I don't see how the, the spectators at the top of the story. I think they take away from the story. So if, we, if the photograph ends just above the ball, I think that helps the story. That is really well done. Especially in such difficult conditions. The artist is Fred Finney. The last one for photojournalism, Arusha Orphan's Refuge. This is another photo where we might study composition. What are the most important elements? To my eye, the child, of course, but also the shoes. The bars on the window echoing the bed frame bars adds a little, as does the wash of red over everything. I tried a much closer crop with a vertical composition that focused in on the essential elements of just the child and the shoes and thought as a photojournalist image, it was much more effective. It still retains the wash of red and some of the bar elements. A photographer might consider these suggestions as an alternative to improve this touching image. And the artist is Lori Woodhall. Now we're going to travel uh, first up, Glenn Crooked Road. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Um, so this is a surreal photo. I love surreal stuff. So, I mean, clearly the, the, the wavy wavy line, that's just awesome. I want it to be real. And um, and so I, I, I've decided that, that really is that line down the road. That really is what it is. Um, but the, the, pho the photographer has made this more surreal. Note the color of the sky. That's weird. And makes it more surreal. Notice the over contrasty ground on either side, and even the over contrasty road. So it's a kind of a creepy, weird feeling, funny. Thank you. It's just awesome. And the artist is Monica Hughes. Next, Tasmanian Maasai Market. The photographer has brought us a scene that seems distant from us geographically and culturally. It attempts to capture a typical market day and a piece of a different kind of life, and it accomplishes that. The photo is essentially about the three people closest to the camera, with the further people being supporting characters. The three closest subjects seem a little cramped to me in the frame, and I wish for more space around them. The photo also suffers from some technical problems like resolution and lens aberration, probably associated with phone camera. Thanks for bringing us a view from your travel. And artist is Lori Woodhall. Next, Desert View. This person is standing by the cliff. I don't like that. I don't like this. And so it, it kind of creeps me out right away. But notice how how there looks like there's a sandstorm. So it really 
blocks the desert view. So no matter what your advantage point, it seems to me the story of this of this photo it it can be blocked and so you just go with what you've got. Um I love the person back is to us. So we are we, for me, I am the person there. I'm looking out and I feel the wind that we can see with the spot. Uh, it's so so very very interesting. Thank you so much. The artist is Bernadette Sylvester. Uh, next, sunrise reflections in Central Park. This is a well composed image of a serene scene. I love the subtle arch of the bridge and how the sun on the water distorts the reflection of the bridge. Capturing the people on the bridge, offset from center, was an excellent timing choice by the photographer, and it adds uh, interesting, an interesting compositional element to the photo. I found that the photo has a distracting green cast and that by moving the tint slider in Lightroom quite a bit to the right toward magenta, the photo has a more natural color balance. Other than that, one could have hoped for a few clouds. Well done. The artist is Allison Colt. Next, Moroccan Village. The story of this photograph, it seems to me, is that human encroachment on nature. And it tells that story extremely well. No, no, the man-made, people-made, vertical, straight lines. You've got right angles, you've got triangles, you've got all that human-made stuff, and the, and the colors are human-made when you look to the left, and it's all natural. So you've got curves, you have no straight lines whatsoever. You have the natural greens, and um, it just tells that amazing story. And the artist is Patricia Levitan. And last in this category, waiting for a water taxi on the Isle of Capri. The photographer has brought us a well-composed and classic travel image. The writing on the sign in the window doesn't dominate and lets us know the scene is a foreign one. I love the repaired suitcase on the left with the torn off sticker and the hanging tag on the right suitcase. Finally, the colorful dress and pose of the woman lets us know that the travelers are needing to be patient. Good shot. And the artist is Rachel Rosenthal. Um, and in the next couple of categories, you just have one entry each. So first of all, for creative fantasy, we have Emergent. Oh, wow. Um, somebody has real Photoshop chops. Um, so the story here is, I'm a little confused, is the woman emerges, emerging out of the tree or is the tree taking over the woman? Um, and I think it's the latter. And so that creeps me out. <laughs> <laughs> Which I guess is the point. Um, and so this is, a, this is a story of maybe nature taking back what people tend to play. Um, but it looks like it's a dead tree, so uh, 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 the, the green at the bottom, wow, that's awesome. And the treatment of the water at the bottom, the, it's the bottom right and left is so nice. Um, the, the texture in the back works beautifully with the color. This is really well done, even though I'm creeped out. <laughs> the artist is Kathy Triola. Next, uh, and we have just one uh, one entry here, manipulated but realistic, Jaffa, Israel, Sunset. The most important elements to my eye in this image are the line of boats from the one in the lower left to the blue tarp boat in the center, and maybe a few boats beyond that, along with the sunset clouds and the rays of light in the sky. I tried cropping a little from the bottom, a lot from the right, and some from the top to focus in on these elements and thought that the photo was improved. The image also has a very warm color temperature cast. <clears throat> and while it adds to the evening feel, it feels a ways too far in my eye. <clears throat> By moving the temperature slider and light room a little to the left, I thought it also improved the photo. I love those glowing bows. Thanks. The artist is Jonathan Beth. Now we're into black and white. First up is flowing. I'm guessing this is from a, a play. Um, 
the lighting looks like it's my favorite book, but but it's so well done. The shot is composed so very, very well with the correct ISO so that we can see the people well. Um it's about the the the, the human contact and it's full of energies with people. And that's beautiful to me. I mean, just I could just spend a whole long time looking at, at how these people are interacting with one another and delve into that story. I have some question about the person in the back on the left, but you know, you can do what you can do. Uh, so very, very well. Thank you so much. The artist is Natalia Pomenoto. Next, one way to happy on. This photo is well on its way to being well composed. The person and the street signs are the essential elements and are well placed in the frame. In my opinion, the lower pavement area of the photo doesn't add much to the composition. And I found that cropping it out to make the photo more square really improves the composition. The photo is also very flat and somewhat dark on my monitor, it's brighter here in the room. And by increasing the contrast and brightness of the photo a lot, the image was improved significantly too. I love the choice of black and white, which fits the story of the photo perfectly. Thanks for sharing. The artist is Allison Holt. Next, we have Balancing Nude. Is she not, is she not only one there? No, I, I don't mean that as a, I don't mean that as a joke. I mean seriously, I took it to my lucky bed. I think she has to, right? I don't know. Um It's really a lovely photograph. The, 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 the diagonal from the far, bottom right to the upper left is, is really telling that with the arm going down, uh, the lighting is, is really, really well done. A really dark upper half, she stands off against it superbly. Um, this, is, this is a beautiful model who apparently has been um, And so it'd be hard to balance. Maybe she's trying to balance it. <laughs> okay. Let's move on. The artist is Robert Arnold. And finally, in this category, up on a lonely mountain in a storm. This is a very challenging image to capture because of the dynamic range of the light, but the photographer has done a pretty good job of capturing all of the tonality. Black and white is the perfect way to go with this photo. To my eye, most of the essential elements are in the top half of the photo, especially the tree, the rain streaks, and the distant mountain. The foreground rocks are just supporting elements but dominate the frame. Um, I'm a little lost what to do about it. I tried cropping 20% of the bottom of the image and found that it improved it a little bit. Um, I also thought that maybe if the photographer had the camera higher, it might make the foreground rock so a little less dominating in the image. Uh, but overall, I thought it was a great photo. Thanks. And the artist is Eric Ingalls. All right, our, we're into color. Uh, first one is high elevation, prime skeleton. Well, so this is very high elevation, and I uh, guess that's one of those ancient crimes that is over with after being thousands of years old. So we've got a story of death. And all around there's life. And you see back into the into the valley, and there's like all the way back, when all the way to the mountains back there. And there's a storm going on that's going to create more life. So it's this really interesting story of tragedy and then the beauty of life in a very arid challenging place beautiful storyteller thank you so much and the artist excuse me the artist is eric Ingalls. and the second and last one in color is the bath felt great but i'm still hungry <laughs> after talking so much about composition and cropping tonight it was gratifying to have this image pop up to show an example of excellent composition. Note how the hawk is offset to the left of the frame, but looking hard right to give us a profile. The oak leaves help fill out the right side of the image, and the tree branch gives a nice non-level element across the bottom. The whole image feels balanced, 
the essential elements are sharp, the colors are complementary and pleasing, and there are, there are details in the deep shadows and non-blown-out highlights. A great job all around. Hurrah! And the artist is Aaron Wesley. And finally, we are at own category. First is beauty in the bush. Well, how fun and epic to get a photograph like this with the, the, the butterfly on these flowers with a bone. Um, sneak up on it and it goes into the movie. Uh, it's as sharp as you can get with the, with the phone. I think that the phone oversaturated the, the flowers. Not uh, the, uh, the, the composition of the diagonal from the lower right to the upper left. I think it works really, really well. It's a, it's a nice shot. Thank you so much. And the artist is Larry Lefman. And lastly, we have, and then I'm probably going to say this wrong, I apologize. Prezemnos. I can't, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce it, um, but it's in Kyiv. This photo makes a fine compositional example, a fine final compositional example of the night. Not to get too preachy, but just because the sensor is rectangular doesn't mean the full rectangular frame needs to be kept in a final image. And all phones now have simple capabilities for cropping photos. The top 30% and bottom 20% of this image don't add anything to the composition, in my opinion. So cropping them to achieve a square composition that includes just the subject and the hint of text makes for a much more powerful image. This photo is already intriguing and interesting and deserves a better framing. What's left after cropping is a very nice image, in my opinion. Thanks. And the artist is Natalia Pomenoto. And that is it for the evening. Thank you so much to our critiquers, Chris Schiller and Frank Boxer. Thank you, Adam, who submitted. Thank you for the And uh, see you next month. Don't forget, September series.